Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Talent Talk, and today I've got a very special guest who was likely part of your childhood if you grew up watching anime. Uh, today I'm speaking to Joshua Seth, who you might know as the lead voice actor as Ty in the Digimon series, or if you're into more of the mature stuff, you might know as uh, Tetsuo in Akira. So, Josh, thanks for joining me. Uh, how are you going today? Hey, I'm going great. How are you doing? I'm doing well. It's nice and early here, but uh, thanks for coming on and uh, having a bit of a chat with me. Right. I'm digging the accent. I want to do a bad version of it. Let's do the entire <laughs> thing where I'm talking in a bag, uh, like Sydney, Australia kind of accent. And we'll talk about <laughs> didgeridoos and dingoes and what else do you have? <laughs> Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> Done. A dingo <laughs> ate my baby. <laughs> I need your baby. That's All right. But no. Okay. I'm, I got that out of my system. <laughs> nice well kicking off uh i'm gonna start with a question you probably got quite a lot uh huh. from now but how did you get started uh voice acting and how did you uh get into pretty much being uh known for ty yeah yeah um you know i think this is an important thing uh for creative people to understand uh, that when people say oh i was a 20 year overnight success like that's a real thing I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to like toil away and and not get paid for 20 years it means that you you pay your dues through training and experience and and missed opportunities and you know like until you're ready so how i got started is way early on when i was a kid i was in professional musical theater productions uh, touring touring broadway shows basically my first one was uh yule brenner's the king and i and i played played prince cello longcorn when i was eight years old um i didn't do the whole tour i did you know where in the area in america where i was uh, mm -hmm. and i wasn't on broadway or anything but it, these were professional shows in big theaters eight times a week and i did that like from the time i was eight to 18 like 10 years of working out my instrument you know singing uh, on stage and in terms of singing training it was really choir in high school um you know learning how to have breath control and and use my instrument uh, you know uh, uh, my voice so that's the training side and then i went to a performing arts college called the uh, chish school of the arts at nyu in new york city and i you know i trained and studied and learned more and while i was there i had a radio show uh 50, watts going out to the tri-state area in new york city I got my radio voice and I would I wouldn't really think anybody was really listening because it was on late night. So I would do funny voices. You know, I'd call myself and hello, can you play some klezma music? Uh, Ma'am, this is a college radio station. Well, I think it's important for the young people, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I would just prank call myself. And then when I graduated college, I had a demo of prank calling myself used it to get an agent in Hollywood, moved out to Los Angeles, kicked around for a few years out there, doing magic as my day job, basically, to earn a living, but also because I was passionate about it. And, uh, you know, I'm going to auditions and either not getting them or they'd be one-offs. It would be like a commercial or I did some stuff for Saban, like uh, in Power Rangers early yep. on. Or in, uh, I was like, I think I was the second, the second Alpha 5. Ay, ay, ay. You know, I didn't realize the staying power of any of these shows at the time. Actually, half the time I wasn't even using my real name for things. I would just put joke names in or my bro my little brother's name, <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. I, I did I did like 64 episodes of a show nobody's seen called Honey Bee Hutch. I played Honey Bee Hutch, you know, Honey Bee Hutch. Honeybee Hutch. That and and I that's I don't know what's ever happened to that show. But I, I kept getting experience, you know. Now at this point, I guess I was a professional. I was in Los Angeles, I had an agent, I was getting paid to do gigs, but it wasn't a lot, you know. I was it wasn't really it wasn't something that was in the zeitgeist and you know, on Saturday mornings or anything. And every once in a while I do I do one thing for Nickelodeon or one thing for Disney or something like that. Uh, but then by the time I had the opportunity, so the end of your question <laughs> was about how I got known for Ty. By the time I had the opportunity to audition for Digimon, the people in the room knew who I was. I'd already been out there for a few years. I'd already worked with the director and the writers. Like they all kind of 
knew me that had been around. So there, there, there is something to be said for people, uh, you know, the know, like, and trust. They want to know, like, and trust you. If you're going to get into a long project, you want to, you want to like the people you're working with. So, so they knew me already. I wasn't just a complete unknown, but I hadn't really, I hadn't had my own series like that yet where I was starring in it. And then, and then the happy little coincidence that happened was when I saw the sides, that's what you call the audition material. It was like one page with a picture of the character. Mm-hmm. And I read it and I looked at him. I, I thought to myself, you know, this guy, this Ty, he's because I didn't know the whole Digimon universe. I just knew what I was looking at. One page of script and his kind of character, his courageous character and his the way like as an actor, I want to inhabit in my body what the character looks like. So I'd hit the pose, you know, and feel what that feels like. I said, you know, this feels kind of like Harry Potter, which Harry Potter was new at the time. And I was reading it out loud, doing all the voices at home just for fun because uh, I don't watch TV. So I do that. Yeah. And and uh, do the funny voices. And, and I thought, yeah, this is like Harry Potter. I'm just going to drop the accent. Uh, like young it up a little bit and kind of be me, but with that, with that backstory, with that internal monologue is what they call it. Yep. Uh, and then that was enough to give me a genuine, authentic, heartfelt take, but also with something more beneath it. I think like uh, back then it wasn't as common that people would just take a very real approach to voicing animation like that that is the norm now but back then they were all kind of silly voices like i've been doing yeah. so far in this in this conversation but but like it was it was a real like i did tie as a real part of my personality that i felt was appropriate for him but also drawing from the story experiences from having read harry potter so i had like like a a whole backstory in my mind of like what kind of personality this is and that was enough to get this show and then it ended up being number one uh saturday morning cartoon and then spawned the seven movies that we've done so far and you know it's and it's still going strong and people still love it and i do these appearances at comic cons all over the world and people say oh that you were the voice of my childhood and uh People have tattoos on the crest of yeah. courage. I've, I've signed people's tattoos. It's crazy. Wow. But at the time, you know, we didn't know that. It was just I was just building into a career over the course of many years. And this is the first thing that took hold and the thing that has lasted the longest. So you didn't believe that or, or know that it was going to be the success that it was when you first walked in that booth? I didn't think about it. It wasn't a matter it was of just belief, another gig. believing it or not. Yeah, it was just another gig that was fun to do and hang out with some guys that, you know, that I knew from the voiceover community. And that, that I think that comes through, too. You can hear it, you know, in people's voice when they're having fun. And yeah, and that's part of the purpose of entertainment was is to, you know, to to really, you know, be present and 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 ex- share joy or mirth or excitement, you know, like the, these higher emotions that uh, you know people don't get to feel all the time in their normal lives because you know life is difficult and has hardships and ups and downs so you know we escape through entertainment and i just say think there's nothing wrong with that and 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 beyond that with something like digimon then you can actually also learn some lessons from the experience as well which is another reason i think that it's so far stood the test of time over a couple decades yeah yeah people attach to a, a deeper meaning or something they find in the show that touches them right it you know it makes you feel good and excited and, and happy and connected but there are there are deeper meanings and there is growth that the characters go through. Yeah. So unlike uh, a couple of the other voice actors I've had on the show, um, you've actually, according to Wikipedia, and I know it's a fact, is that you've uh, technically retired from being a voice actor. Um, yeah, so it, yeah, true. I mean, I go back for the Digimon movies the last few years. That's what I was touching just, on. So what was it yeah. about those movies and the character of Ty that made you essentially come out of retirement for the Adventure Tri films? Was it that you wanted to be respectful to, to the fans and let them have the Ty that they essentially grew up with? Or was it just that it's a character that you uh, would do that kind of thing for? Well, yeah, and only that because I... I feel personally connected to Ty, you know, like I didn't, I didn't want to hear other people voicing him. And I know that it happened when I turned down a couple of things in the past and it irked me, 
um, but I was on tour and yeah. I don't live in Los Angeles anymore. So it wasn't, you nah. know, it, it's not an easy decision to come back for that stuff because I fly all the way across the country and I have to turn down other gigs, you know, with, with the live shows that I do now. And it's a time commitment. So it's not just like, oh, I'll just hop in an Uber and go across town and do it. Like it's, it's a commitment. Yeah, that's right. And then I, you know, I want to support the project and do things like this, like podcasts and Comic-Con appearances and social media uh, and interacting with the fans. So it's a big time commitment to come back, but I wanted to do it for my own, for myself, for my own personal connection to tie into Digimon and that legacy. And also for the fans, because they have been so supportive and I wouldn't have this career without the support of the fans. So I wanted to give back in that way. But also, and probably most importantly, I have two little kids now. Nice. And, yep. you know, I want to I want to show them in real time that anything is possible in your life, that you can you can do whatever the hell you want to do in life. You know, like it like there's nothing wrong if you want to have a nine to five job. But if you don't, you know, if you want to be in a creative profession or or just, you know, make something up and do it. As long as you're committed to doing it well and it serves other people or benefits people in some way, I say do it and the, there's a and they'll and the way will open to you. And so I wanted to demonstrate that for them, like Dada's gonna go voice a movie. Let's go mm. to the theater together, kids, and watch, you know, the movie screen. It kinda you know, I know it blows their mind. And it's not so I can be like, Hey, I'm best dad in the world, I'm so impressive. <laughs> it's so that it's so that they can kind of uh, expand their consciousness to accept the truth which is if we believe in ourselves and we are committed to excellence you know we can achieve anything we set out to do yeah i think that's a fantastic kind of role except in relationships i'll say personally and professionally (laughs) (laughs) but it's been a hard lesson for me that that's just not always the case when you're like you know in a romantic relationship with someone because they're on their own life's journey so In terms of your life's journey, though, I stand by my statement. So, yeah, I'm not sure if you've heard that there's plans for another Digimon movie coming out this year in Japan that follows the original Digidestined again, but coming back in their early 20s. If approached, would you love to play Ty again? Yeah, of course I'd love it. Uh, If approached is the big thing because nobody did approach me for Digimon Ty. Nobody reached out to me. I had heard they'd already cast it and started recording with someone else. I I don't know who that person is. Sorry. (laughs) You lost the gig to whomever that was, but... But it was all the fans that started a, like online uprising once they heard and, and um, you know, made me aware that that was going on and made the people on the production side of things, you know, aware that I said that I would do it when they asked on Facebook. I yeah. think it was. And then we ended up having a phone conversation and the whole thing came together. So this was a, an example of a, a fan activism, you know, actually causing this thing to happen. That That may have to happen again because they don't always necessarily think of me because I'm not in that world anymore. Mm, you know the yeah, regular face in LA exactly I'm not going to the parties and you know yep. I'm not on the casting calls and I'm just I'm not around because I'm doing this other thing being on tour well that's a perfect segue to, to jump into that kind of stuff so since stepping away from voice acting you've moved into what well, was magic but now you're like a mentalist keynote speaker can you talk a little bit about what you're doing and what your live show is and and possibly even a little bit about your book it's a bestseller yeah, sure. finding focus in a busy world I know um it's uh, it's actually now we're on the the uh, the revised edition, and I changed the title of the book to Finding Focus in a Changing World. Okay. Uh, and it's about how to how to basically achieve anything, think differently, how to make the impossible possible. And the more I would sort of live my life and have these experiences and talk to people about them, the more I realized I had this message to share, especially with creative people. Actually, no, I I take that back. Initially, I thought it was just for creative people like myself because. We need to really hear the message that it is possible to be a creative person and to and to do something with that gift and to and to have some impact, whether or not it becomes your primary profession. But, you know, we're not really given that message in school or in life. Generally, people, you know, unless you're a kid, they just don't care or they give you the message that, you know, you you need to go, you know, do something productive with your life. Well, you know, this is productive as well. It makes people happy. And that's a, a high calling. So, yeah, initially. Uh, I did the speaking and the writing to share that message. And then I started to realize as I started to become a keynote speaker uh, for in for corporate audiences and for business audiences, they need that message even more because uh, the pace of change, the technology and just the world that we're living in, everything is changing so fast. We have to stay uh, very nimble and adaptable and innovative in our thinking. We can't be rigid 
been stuck in the past. So guess who's like, guess who thinks like that? Creative mm-hmm. people. Yeah. Creative people are always taking ideas from different areas, putting them together, making something new. So what I talk about is how to embrace change and collaborate, uh, because that's what you do in the arts is you collaborate, you come together as a team and make something happen and, and innovate because that's what creativity is. It's innovation is creativity uh, in the marketplace, not just for yourself. In no, other words. Right. Um, yeah, so that's what I talk about now. And the book is about how to think differently so that you can free your mind from the co- constraints of our typical assumptions, expectations and beliefs and you know, and have the benefit of, of those new paradigms. And even in the shows that I've been doing now for 12 years and I've performed in over 40 countries and I've done thousands of shows and I performed in Vegas and on big stages and had TV specials in Japan, two of them, and wow. two of them in South Korea. In all the shows, that, which I'm a mentalist, you mentioned, so for people that don't know, it's sort of like magic of the mind or thought experiments. It's not the way I do it. It's not actual magic tricks, but their thought experiments are a good way to think of them. They're interactive brain games and mental exercises that are entertaining with the audiences and, and mind-blowing, but also open your mind to the idea that there's more to life than meets the eye, that there are the, these invisible connections that lie hidden just beneath the surface that once recognized um, can blow your mind and change your reality. So that's what the, that's what the show is really about. And I'm doing a big theater uh, in Cleveland next week for the ninth year in a row, thousand seats, and we always sell it out. So once people come to see it, like they get it. And I do it at, at Comic Cons when they bring me in for that mm-hmm. as well. And uh, you know, it's just uh, the electricity in the room. It's just an amazing experience. And I do a little bit of the voices and stuff, and and talk about how how all this stuff is connected, just creativity and thinking differently about life and yourself and your connection with other people. How how that's important and and life-changing so whether it's the show the book or the speeches it's, it's really all about that that's awesome so the book the the focus of the book uh, i think i saw in a previous video of yours is to is it to change your mindset or to open your mind to the new ways of learning and dealing with the the busy world i believe you yes i'd say you the latter. those it's... um not the framework of the book but your your kind of messages of the book or the the things that you're talking about in the book to to achieve college in half the time yeah which i did um yeah it's about how and because it, it's not intelligence it's uh it's about where to put your focus and in terms of mindset it's how to believe in yourself how to believe in your idea how to be te- tenacious and stick with it in the face of adversity. I'll give you an example, okay? Because uh, these are very abstract concepts, but here's an example. Mm-hmm. So the typical way to think of adversity or the pressure that comes at you when you want to break through and do something like have a career in voiceovers, for instance, or put up a podcast in your case or or whatever. Like I know a lot of people that come to Comic-Cons have vis- their visual artists because they show me the drawings that they do that I'm amazed by because I, I that's not where my talent lies. Yep. Uh, but let, and so let's say they want to stage an art show or compete in one. So our our minds tend to, in the face of of the adversity of life, shut down and you know tell us that we can't do it. Uh, it, it we want to push through, right? We want to believe in ourselves and in our ideas, and that can be hard. But if you change your mindset to the following, it becomes easy. So the following is this: It's I believe a quote from Henry Ford that an airplane takes off against the wind because it requires that resistance in order to gain lift. You follow? Yeah. yeah so in talent. other words, in other words, instead of thinking of the resistance and the pushback as a bad thing, as a hard thing, as you know, the, the thing that's stopping you from getting, Oh, uh, you know, if only I, if only I didn't have these headwinds against me, I could make it. Instead of thinking that you shift your, your mindset to, Oh, it's helping me. It's actually helping me to become better. How do that I use that thing. to rise kind of thing? Yeah. And that it, well, that is how you use it. Yeah. You just change your thinking about it. And that, and that extends to everything in life. You know, my, uh, my parents are psychologists. My dad is a hypnotherapist. I studied hypnosis and actually before I became a mentalist, my, I still do this show from time to time, like at colleges and on cruise ships, but I did thousands of comedy hypnosis shows and that's what hypnosis is all about. It's all, it's all, uh, mental exercises to retrain your brain and and it, it's very valuable uh, and not something that's typically taught in Western culture but I maintain that, that sort of training is more important than just kind of getting A's on tests 
because yeah. you could come out of school with like a whole head full of book learning. But if you're not in control of your own mind, your own emotions, and your own attitudes and perspective, you know, in a way that serves you, uh, then it'll suppress how far you're able to get in life. Contrary to that, you know, if you spend some time on these things, like, you know, how to how to be the master of your own emotions, right? A lot of people go out to Hollywood and they're faced with adversity and they quit, you know, and they go back to Ohio or whatever, where I'm from. If you, you just to keep on this one example, you know, if you look at the adversity at every missed opportunity and unbooked audition as making you stronger and a way to learn something, then instead of leaving you, you rise to the challenge uh, and eventually you're ready, you know, and the opportunity presents itself. That's what happened with me with Digimon. Good piece of uh, motivational talk there. Hey now. <laughs> uh, so before it's we funny because I, I didn't used to Sorry. believe in like motivational stuff. I used to think it's a bunch of sappy BS. Yeah. Uh, but, 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 there, but, when, but when it's connected to philosophy like that, yeah, I think it can be life-changing and really important. I just like to connect it to actual, actual mental disciplines and emotional disciplines. That's the other thing I was kind of dancing around is like, so in the arts and for creative people, and I'm talking about this because it's a podcast for people interested in voice actors. Obviously, they're yeah. you know they're, these are special people that are not they're not your normal boring you know worker bee people. They're people that have you know, I think of somebody who's nerdy. I'm thinking of somebody who's a, a deep passion and interest you know in a, in a niche area. Yeah. So yeah. so these are passionate people by definition. So these emotions they can rule your life. They can be a double-edged sword as well and and they can uh, propel us to create things and create change in our lives or they can cause us to not want to lift our head off the pillow as well yeah, so right. when you understand that and you understand that there are actual techniques that you can use uh you know to to harness that the power of those emotions and those thoughts and those expectations and beliefs um you know then yeah then you can be like a rocket ship so yeah i do think it's valuable Really good answer. So your uh, your book for anyone that I'm wants to go and, <laughs> your book that for anyone that wants to talk uh, to uh, think about going to grab it. You just mentioned does it teach you those techniques or does it talk yes. about them uh, you just the generally? Yeah, no specific techniques. Yeah, I'm not trying to like pitch my book, but yeah. no, no, <laughs> I no, no. talk about it. It's yeah, it's uh, just look up my name or on Amazon or finding focus in a changing world. Yeah, and you'll see it. Uh, or on Audible or iTunes, I have the I have the audio version, and I can read you the book. No, I, I mentioned it because I thought it'd be helpful for quite sure. a few people. Uh, so yeah, before sometimes we wrap at up, Comic Cons, I, I touch on these topics as well because everybody wants to know, hey, how'd you get into voiceover, and what was yep. you know the most cool thing or whatever. I'm like, yeah, that stuff's interesting, but the stuff I learned as a result of the process, I think, is even more important. I mean, I had no money for seven years. Uh, riding around in a 1974 Super Beetle in Los Angeles, wow. and the heat would never go off in LA <laughs> in the summer, you know. And I stuck with it because I was passionate about what I was doing. I believed in myself, and I had the right mindset to look at at uh, the whole process as a learning opportunity. And you know, and it was finally in the right place at the right time when I was ready. And that's what Digimon had, and that's when all the other stuff. I mean, according to Wikipedia, I've been in like a hundred things, mm -hmm. uh, and then. You know, and then and then just moved on so that I could uh, kind of explore the world and and uh, create my own content. That was the other reason too. So I could, you know, there's a certain limitation to just giving life to the words on a page that someone else has written. Of course, eventually yeah. you want to write them yourself. Yep. That's why I do the live speaking and the live shows now. Fantastic. So. Before we head off, uh, I just want to know a little bit more about you and your off time. So you mentioned you don't watch TV. What do you do uh, outside of your shows or your uh, well, no no longer anime acting just to, in your downtime when you're not working to yeah, relax? Yeah. Sure. Well, I, you know, I travel a lot because I'm always flying to the gigs. So when I don't have my kids, then I'll stay wherever I am generally. So, for instance, I, I just came back from... Where did I uh, go in December? Uh, Ecuador. So I was down in Ecuador for like a week and and hiked around, hiked a, a volcano and and um, you had a llama and rode horses and oh. you just did a bunch of really cool stuff. Uh, and then I jumped on a cruise ship to do a gig and I'm like, oh well, I'm in Costa Rica. I go zip lining and go see some monkeys, things like that. So there's all that. And then I moved to Florida, you know, and I live like in the land of 
endless summer and I got a paddle board. So I like to go paddle boarding um, and uh, just hang out on the beach. And I'd like to do yoga and uh, and read oh, and cook. I've been learning to cook. So that's another mindset shift. So when I, yeah, you know, when my, my, when my marriage ended a few years ago, I thought, Oh man, I know how am I going to make, make food for myself <laughs> and the kids. That was one of the main things. And, and then I realized, Oh, this is a creative endeavor too. And I started to learn yeah. how to cook and, 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 you know, I got like certain kinds of music that I like to listen to certain kinds of ingredients and cuisine that I like to prepare. And like, I really kind of like, it's like edible art. You know, so I like that. Yeah, no, too. I, so, I enjoy cooking yeah. too. I find it quite therapeutic. It, 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 yes, it, exactly. Yeah, it's very relaxing, and then you get to eat what you made. Exactly. Win win. Yeah. And I and I work out a lot because I have a lot of energy, crazy amount of energy. <laughs> I, I only sleep like five somewhere. hours a night, and then I pop up, and I'm like, okay, right, let's go, let's do something today. Let's go run on the beach. So are you generally like hyped up after your shows, and then hit the gym after your live shows, or? Yeah, because um, I don't really enjoy drinking. You know, I'll have like a glass of wine or something with a steak, but like, yeah, yeah, I get a head, I get a headache the next day. So like, I just I feel worse after than I feel good during. So why do it? So I don't. So mo- exactly. the reason I bring that up is you have so much energy after a show. Just a couple nights ago, I did a, a show for a thousand people up in Baltimore, and you got the roar of the crowd in your ears. And actually, that was the hypnosis show, and it's it's total rock star at the end, standing ovation. <laughs> It's so awesome. And then I'm on the road and I'm by myself and I go back to the hotel room and it's quiet and it's empty no. and you're alone yourself. So, yeah, I'll hit the gym and I'll go running, you know, and then I'll read a book. Uh, you know, I'll burn off all that energy and, and try to do it in a productive, constructive way. It's, there's a, an element uh, of a solitary monk like um, existence that I've had to adapt to, you know, in order to do that. But I figured the other option is what so many creative people do on the road which is okay you take all that energy and you hit the bars and you go pick people up and you go you know like you just basically just destroy your body uh so i have i haven't done that and i think that's why um i've got a lot of energy and life i got a lot of kick in me still because i'm you know i'm just uh uh, so goes on all these podcasts doing Aussie yeah. accents right <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and i'm always reading like three books so that's it keeps your brain engaged. Got to be jumping be between them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on you know, in different topics and areas because I like to combine ideas. So if you're getting if your brain is stimulated by you know several ideas in several areas at once, then you can elevate that thinking by stitching them together with your life experience and you know whatever you're thinking about at the moment and come up with something new. That's what creativity is: taking different ideas and creating something new through that combination. Like cooking, that so, alchemy. Oh, yeah, alchemy. you got to have a bit of that in your kitchen. You just made me kind of think of another question. Just then when you mentioned the uh, the, the stadium full of people all cheering at the end, do you think that's because, uh, like, you're in a, a field where probably a lot of people would either come to the show or uh, from the outside looking in be quite skeptical of what you do? And do you think that the, the reactions you get at the end is an, a further level of achievement if you've been able to, con- uh, like, convince them or – or show well, them that what you do is... I don't is... think so. Yeah, I don't think so because I'm very clear that uh, with myself that I'm not attempting to change anyone's mind or convince mm-hmm. them of anything. That would be a different kind of a show. All I'm doing is I'm just very excited about what I do, committed to doing it very well, you know, and kind of sharing my my energy and expertise and excitement with that audience. And I think that's what they're responding to. You know, plus mm-hmm. the... Plus the shows are funny and mind blowing, but nice. but I think they're I think they're vibing off the energy that I'm giving out. Yeah, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm just kind of sh- sharing, sharing. Uh, 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 I'm just resonating at a certain level or sharing an energy uh, level with them that they're that that hypes them up and they're responding to and makes them happy. So that's an enjoyable pursuit. So right before we head off, uh, thanks yeah. again for joining me and uh, talking That's about your cool. anime endeavors and and what you're doing now and your book and things like that. Uh, before we head off, uh, where where can fans find you on the internet? And uh, feel free to pitch what you're doing now. Sure. Uh, Instagram is easy, just Joshua Seth, or uh, look up Joshua Seth on 
Facebook, but but do the do the fan page because people try to you know connect with me personally on that, no. and I've got just this long list of people that I haven't responded to to say hey go check out the fan page because the personal page is like mostly about my kids. Yeah, but, you and your family you know, and people you actually yeah, know. Yeah, that stuff. The stuff you guys want to know is on on the fan page or just in Instagram. I'm trying to get off of Twitter because it's so toxic here in America, but you know I'm there as well. You know, or if you have an event coming up and you want to see what I can do for it. Go to joshuaseth.com and all the videos and info uh, are right there. And, of course, on Amazon for the book, just look up my name. Awesome. So thanks again, Josh, for for coming on to the show. And uh, fingers crossed we can maybe see you uh, down here in Australia sometime soon and see the show for myself. Yeah, that's that'd be awesome. A couple of times I've been there and I've done uh, – what's the name of that big Comic-Con – in sydney is it armageddon or is that in new zealand uh there is armageddon in new zealand we have uh, a yeah. supernova here supernova i haven't done supernova in years so if you're listening out there <laughs> uh, <laughs> give me a call yeah i'll come back that would be awesome i might send them an email and say hey he's interested cool yeah let's do it all right thanks man uh, no worries man thank you so much da, 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 da. Boing. thanks for tuning in to this episode of talent talk Look forward to next week's episode where I'll be sitting down and talking to another voice actor from the anime industry and picking their brain. If you liked this episode, please consider subscribing on YouTube or on your podcasting platform of choice so you never miss an episode. And feel free to communicate with me on Twitter at anygame underscore AU. That's A-N-I-G-A-M-E underscore A-U. And let me know who you'd love to see on the show. This has been Joel from Anygame, and I'll catch you in the next episode.